Let us turn back to that passage that we read in Isaiah chapter 51 and verses 1 to 8. The first title I had for the message was Counsel for the Church, but I think I prefer the second title that I have for it, which is Encouragement for the Elect. Encouragement for the Elect. In days like this, we need as much encouragement and indeed counsel as we can get, especially from the Lord. In fact, only from the Lord. And in these verses, God himself is the one giving both encouragement and counsel to his church, to his elect people. Probably one of the first things you notice In the verses is in verses 1, 4, and 7. There is this call to hear. It is hearken to me. It is listen to the Lord. Not just listen to the prophet. But hear God. Hear what God has to say. Hear his words. His counsel. His encouragement. Of course this is the problem with our day and with this moment in history as so often is the case we think that at least at this point people will hear God at least now people will listen to the Lord and that is sadly not the case as we preach in Dublin City on Thursdays with our brothers and sisters we see people as careless now as ever about the things of God, about their soul. You would imagine that when at least the fear, whether that is rational fear or irrational fear, it's there. And yet people still are not concerned for their souls. But the Lord here is not speaking to the masses. He's not speaking to mankind in general. He is speaking to his people. He is giving counsel to his church. He is giving encouragement to his elect people. He wants them to hear in particular. He wants them to hear for their good and for their blessing. And if we are the people of God, we need to listen not only to the word of God as a whole, of course, which we must, but tonight to these verses in particular. Notice three things, or at least uh, three parts to our outline this evening. We're going to consider what God has done in verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 to 6, what God will do. And then thirdly, in verses 7 and 8, the result or the consequence of all this. So, first of all, what God has done in verses 1 and 2. And we'll notice the the who, the what, and the why of what God has done. Consider the who of the verses. Who is it that is addressed? We've already answered that question. But it says it in verse 1. Ye that follow after righteousness. Ye that seek the Lord. I have two quotes from Calvin tonight. Here's the first one. Calvin says, He does not speak to all, but to those only who could rely on the promise. That is, to those whom he calls followers of righteousness. For the country abounded with unbelievers and hypocrites who had formerly revolted from the practice of piety. Wherever righteousness is practiced there God is listened to and wherever unbelief reigns reliance cannot be placed on any promise get that what he says at the end there wherever unbelief reigns reliance cannot be placed on any promise why because God is speaking to those that follow after righteousness, that those who seek the Lord to believers, 
to those who trust in him and seek him with all their heart. This is the who of this first point. But then the what of these verses. What is to be done in the context of what God has done? First of all, as we have said, it is listen, it is hearken to me, listen to God. Also, it is in verse 1, look unto the rock whence you're hewn. Know where you've come from. Now, some commentators have made a big issue out of the rock and, and the pit that is referred to in verse 1. But really the point is, or as Calvin says, the metaphor really is, look where you've come from. Look back to what God has done in the past. Listen and think about what God has done for you. Don't live in ignorance of the doings of God. Don't live in ignorance like the unbeliever. Don't live like those who who have no God, who have no hope. In this world, to use the words of the Apostle Paul. You see, a rock and a pit, the one thing we can say about both of them is they will remain a rock and a pit unless something is done. And God has hewn them out of a rock, He has digged them out of a pit in history. It was literally true for the people of God in the Old Testament. There was a time when Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees was in that idolatrous ignorance and God called him. God effectually called him to himself. And therefore the people are to look to this reality. That's the what. But then the why. For I called him, that is Abraham your father, in verse 2, and blessed him and increased him. I should have mentioned verse 2 in the previous point as part of the what. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you. Why? Because I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Think about this. Think about God's relationship to Abraham. Think about God's relationship that began with a call and then progressed in ever increasing blessings. So that when God calls a sinner, the blessings of heaven and earth are included in that call. All things are ours in Jesus Christ. The the belief in the gospel and God giving us the truth of the gospel includes every single blessing that could be imagined and even those that cannot be imagined. This is the why. Think of the personal call to Abraham. Think of the exclusive call. Think of the blessed call and think of the prosperous call. All that was included in God calling Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Why is God saying this? He's saying this to the nation because they were living like the world. Even God's people, even God's people who are genuine believers have been affected by this. And God is speaking specifically to his elect people and telling them to be to be different, to to live and to and to trust in him as those who have been called like Abraham and like Sarah. Enter in to the fullness of your blessings, if you like, is what the Lord is saying. So that is what God has done. But then secondly, what God will do. In verses 3 to 6, what will God do? The God who had called Abraham and who had blessed him and prospered him, this is the God who is going to bring comfort just as he comforted Abraham and Sarah with the birth of Isaac 
This is the God who will comfort his people. Yet again, we consider this principle back in Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort ye. So God is saying to the prophet, the ministry of the prophet is to comfort my people, saith your God. A preacher who does not bring comfort to God's people is no preacher. One of the the main callings of a minister of the gospel is to bring gospel comfort, is to bring scriptural comfort, not just fair words and speeches, but to comfort God's people with the word of God. And that's why there's no safer or more beneficial method in the ministry than simply to proclaim God's word, the unvarnished, the unadulterated word of God, because that is that which brings comfort to our souls. Comfort, my people, saith your God, speak Comfortably to Jerusalem, Isaiah 40 and verse 2, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Our present text says in verse 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion, and he will comfort all her waste places the point being and even as we said earlier on today about having a degree of barrenness of soul when there's barrenness when there's when there's waste places in the soul the lord is the one who can bring his comfort to those places the lord and the lord alone is the one who can comfort his people yes he uses his servants the prophets of today preachers and pastors But in the end, it is only God that has the power to comfort his people. We are but servants. The Lord is the one who gives the increase. He is the one that can call those things that are not as though they were. To give life to the dead, to raise out of these rocks children unto Abraham. The Lord alone can do this and does do this. The God who has done great things is the God who will do great things. This is the confidence of faith. He's the one who brings life to the wilderness, to the desert. Joy, thanksgiving song, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, a reversal of the fall. See that? He will make her wilderness like Eden, a reversal of the fall, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Sing a new song to the Lord, the song of redemption. The, again, the joy that comes from knowing the Lord in all his saving reality. To know God as he is in Jesus Christ. Last week at our prayer meeting, we considered Psalm 126 verse, or sorry, the whole of the psalm. And this psalm is actually concerned with this song of the deliverance from the captivity. And it says in Psalm 126, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. You know, we we, we discussed last Tuesday the idea when something uh, really uh, amazing happens, you think, am I in a dream? That's exactly what's being said here. In Psalm 126, then was our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us. Again, this is what the Lord has done, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south fill the wilderness, fill the desert places, and so on. Sowing in tears, reaping in joy, going forward weeping, bearing precious seed, and we will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us. Let us continue to preach the gospel. And we continue, don't we, at least um, midweek, and we should daily preach the gospel. Why? Because that is the answer to the day in which we're in. The greatest need 
is the gospel. The greatest need is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. Nothing else will do what our text says. Nothing else will give a barren desert and wilderness a transformation into the garden of the Lord, into the, into the paradise of God, like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our second quote from Calvin says this, To us also in the present day, amidst this distracted, and, and these words of Calvin could have been written today. He says, amidst this distracted condition of the church. You see, it's one thing for the, the world to be distracted. We understand that. But Calvin is saying the distracted church, again, it was the same in the Old Testament. It's 700 BC with Isaiah. It's the same with Calvin. It's the same today. He says, it is highly necessary that we may not be discouraged because our number is small. And that we may hope that God, listen, that God will increase his church by unexpected methods. How helpful that is. This is the God who does his work, his strange work. And we might feel inhibited. But this Day, this time is not a time to feel restricted, but to realize that God is doing something new. I'm sort of jumping ahead of myself, but God is shaking the heavens, as we'll see in a few moments. How God will bring these blessings to pass in verses 4 to 6. Very briefly, five ways. First of all, by his effectual call of his people. Verse 4, it is hearken unto me, my people. This is not a vain attempt to get attention. This is God calling his people to attention. Give ear unto me, O my nation. We are reminded in God's effectual call in Psalm 127 that God willing will be considering this Tuesday. In our prayer meeting. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman waketh but in vain. We need God to do the work. We need God to be the builder. We need God to begin. And to finish the work. As Philippians 1 verse 6 reminds us. Secondly. This work will be done. By the giving of his word. For the law shall proceed from me. And I will make my judgment to rest. For the light of the people. Consider what great act of kindness it is. For God to give his word. In fact. uh, In contrast. The greatest act of judgment. God can bring upon a people. Is what? To be silent. To be silent. That's why Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 says this. Behold the day is come saith the Lord God. That I will send famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water. But of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea. And from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. And shall not find it. Listen these blessings that are going to come on the people, are going to come, first of all, by God's effectual call, but secondly, by the giving of his word. And that's why the gospel must be preached. Keep preaching, as Paul said to Timothy, keep preaching the word. In season, out of season, whether there's a virus or not a virus, whether the government says we shouldn't uh, go here or go there, keep preaching the word of God, because that is the only hope for this nation. That is the only hope for the soul. Thirdly, God will bring these blessings to pass by a present or realized salvation. His saving power, verse 5. My righteousness is near. My salvation. Now notice, often in scripture, righteousness and salvation are put together. They are one thing. We can never 
separate salvation and righteousness and make them different. No, we are saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. And mine arm shall judge the people. The isle shall wait upon me. And on mine arm shall they trust. It is my righteousness. It is my salvation. It is my arms. It is God who does it. His right arm of salvation. His strong arm shall work this work. This blessing for his people. This is encouragement for his elect. This is counsel for his church. This is advice to the needy. To those who hunger and thirst after righteousness and we shall indeed be filled fourthly these blessings are brought to pass not only by effectual call and the giving of the word and a a present or realized salvation but fourthly by a complete change of the order of things a complete change of the order of things that's what verse 6 is talking about it's not literally saying that the heavens will vanish away like smoke or or the earth shall wax old like a garment. But as the prophetic language means is there will be a complete change of the order. The status quo will be completely turned upside down. To use the words in Acts, these men have turned the world upside down with their doctrine. And again, not literally turned the world upside down, but have changed the order of things. And this is what the gospel does. This is when God does his work, the order of things changes. We don't need a hundred years. We think in our human wisdom, well, it's going to take generations for things to change not at all when God moves it could happen in a day God could change this nation in a day it's not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord God can do vastly more than we can even imagine and that's why we trust in him we trust in his call we trust in his word we trust in his power to save we trust in the in the one that can completely transform this earth overnight which he has done which he has done whether the the virus is as dangerous as they say is really beside the point God has done a work in this world and the world is in fear and in dread. They are fearing the wrong thing. But God has begun a work that only he could have done. And it's time for the church to arise. It is time for the church to believe. It is time for the church to afresh seek the Lord, to follow after righteousness, to trust in his salvation. It is time for us To stand as the people of God, not to be in fear like the world, not to be in dread of of losing our physical life, but be willing to give all that we are and all that we have and all that we can do for the glory of God, for the good of souls and for the salvation of sinners. Fifthly, not only will God bring these blessings to pass by his effectual call, the giving of his word, his power to save and his power to completely change the order of things but fifthly by contrast his salvation is unchangeable in verse five or sorry in verse six it says that the whole world can change jesus says heaven and earth will pass away but my word shall not pass away it says at the end of verse six but my salvation shall be forever And my righteousness, there it is again, salvation and righteousness together in one. My righteousness shall not be abolished. There's only one thing that lasts in this world. And that is the word of God. The word of the living, the everlasting, the eternal God of heaven and earth. And then lastly, third point, the result of... Or the consequence of all this. Two things or three things to consider as we close. To whom 
this consequence is addressed. Notice verse 7. And there's a difference. Again, it's righteousness. Again, it's hearken to me. But it's not hearken to me, ye that follow righteousness. Now it is hearken unto me, ye that what? Know righteousness. There's a progression of thought. There is a greater uh, advancement. It's following. Now it is knowing. Paul in Philippians 3, that great chapter that deals with this pursuit of the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ and never being satisfied with yesterday's blessings but wanting to to advance and to progress in righteousness. Now it's ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. As Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul could say that he, he, he loved the law of God in the inner man. The psalmist could say, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation both day and night. You see, the great problem today is not the lack of the world seeking the word of God. It is the lack of the people of God seeking the word of God. We need to know him. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Is that true of us? Do we know him? Do we love the law of God? God's message is to his elect people, his people who know him and who love him. That's why Psalm 25 Verse 14 says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. This is not some, you know, secret hidden knowledge. This is the gospel. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. To know Christ in the gospel of grace, in the covenant of grace, is to know everything. The answer. You know, it's interesting and a if I can sort of share a personal experience. I remember as a child having this idea that there's some knowledge out there. There's something that most of us, I actually literally had this thought as a child. There's something out there in the world that a lot of people are missing. Now I know what it was. It's the gospel. There's so many people who live their whole life in this world and never have an inkling of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. And secondly, what they are not to do. Because we know righteousness, because we love the law of our God. We are not to fear the reproach of men. We are not to be afraid of their revilings because we are God's people. We are God's people. The world is in fear. God's people are not to be gripped by the same fear. They that trust in the Lord are as bold as a lion. The righteous are confident, not in themselves, but in their God. The cowards will have their place in the lake of fire. Strong, take the kingdom of heaven. Take the gates of heaven by force. Take hold of God and say, we will not let thee go unless we receive all the blessings that we have. In Christ, always advancing, always wanting to know more of him, always longing to know him more. The great example of the Apostle Paul, as he speaks to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24, we read, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Listen to what he says. But none of these things move me. None of these things move me. doesn't matter what's ahead. And even that the, the Holy Spirit has told me that bonds and afflictions are waiting for me. 
neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Or not to fear the reproach of men or be afraid of their reviling. Serve the Lord. Fear the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord casts out the fear of man. Why? Twofold reason why the fear Why we're not to fear the reproach of the revilings of men. First of all in verse 8. Because their complete demise and destruction is ahead. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment. And the worm shall eat them like wool. Voltaire said in 50 years time. The word of God will be gone. The word of God is still here. And the word of God is advancing throughout the world. Probably only in western Europe is the word of God at least visibly on a demise. But in all the world, the word of God and the gospel is advancing. In China, in India, in most of Asia, in Africa, South America, even North America, yes, Western Europe, seems to be a place where we are the darkness at the moment in in comparison. But the word of God is advancing. And uh, as those who live in this part of the world, let us not say, well, this is the way things are going to be for the foreseeable future. No. We take hold of Christ in the covenant of grace and call out to him for his blessings, call out to him for revival, call out to him for reformation and never be satisfied with second best. Never be satisfied with church That is something less than what God has called it to be. The second reason, not only should we not fear because of their complete demise and destruction, but secondly, because God's salvation is everlasting. But my righteousness, a contrast again, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. Again, the words of Jesus Christ. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Well, there is much application. May God apply his word to our souls. And may we be those who follow after righteousness. And know righteousness. And therefore live in the knowledge of him who is our strength, our refuge, our fortress, and makes us bold as a lion, as courageous as we should be as the people of God. May God bless his word to our souls. Amen. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 126. Psalm 126. When Zion's bondage God turned back, as men that dreamed were we, then filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. They among the heathen said, The Lord great things for them had wrought. The Lord hath done great things for us. Whence joy to us is brought. Psalm 126, singing the whole of the psalm. And then we'll close in prayer. When Zion's bondage got turned back As men that dream were we then filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. They mong the heaven, said the Lord, great things for them hath wrought. Oh.
Let us close in prayer. Father, we we thank, we bless Thee for this precious passage of Thy Word, this encouragement to Thy people, this counsel to Thy church to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might to realize that we are more than conquerors through and by and in him that has loved us and called us by his grace. That in Jesus Christ, we reign with God and we reign with his son, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What mercy, what grace, what unfathomable mercy to God's people so that we have not just been forgiven. We've been justified. We've been sanctified. We have been adopted as the children of God, uh, his very sons. We have been united to Jesus Christ so that we are called the body of Christ, one with him, united to our mediator in the covenant of grace and recipients of all the blessings of that blessed covenant. O Lord, we give thee thanks and praise for all that thou hast done for our souls in our Saviour's name. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen.